I became interested in biological anthropology and questions about human evolution when I was fairly young. I found the study of living primates and bones and uh, interactions with the environment to be really engrossing, even as a you know, high school student. And I didn't realize you could make a career out of studying you know, our evolutionary history or a better understanding our biology until I was in graduate school uh, pursuing a PhD. At the time, I thought I was interested in studying how living apes were behaving, and I discovered that there's a whole field of study of skeletal biology, and particularly uh, how bones and teeth grow, that's based on knowledge of biological rhythms, or these clocks in our bodies. And I became fascinated with the idea that we have these really faithful recording mechanisms um, operating in our bodies as we're growing and developing that can give us really important insights into our own evolutionary history. So I turned to the study of teeth as a young graduate student because there were a lot of questions that we didn't have answers to at the time, we're still working on today, that help us to really ask, uh, you know, how did we come to be the way we are today? You know, when in our human history did we show modern-like patterns of growth and development? When did we move from a more ape-like ancestor to something more like what we find on the planet today? And where and under what conditions did those changes occur? What you're seeing here are different models of human children at different developmental stages of their teeth. Most parents don't recognize that they're small children their faces are actually full of these growing and developing tooth crowns that begin forming before they're born and continue until they're 18 to 20 years of age. So here you're seeing different stages in the development of baby teeth as well as the permanent teeth. When we recover fossils in the various parts of Africa and in Europe and Asia, oftentimes we look at the number of teeth that have come out to be able to give an age to an individual. There's a predictable series of events that happen as children are growing and developing. Uh, many parents know the incisors and the front come in first as an infant's teething, and then later the more posterior molars come in. By using knowledge of the internal growth patterns, we can give even more accurate estimates of an individual's death. So these basic developmental stages are interesting, but we have now the power to really understand ages of individuals and histories of individuals with much more precision than we ever have in the past. Not only are teeth interesting because we have many of them in the fossil record, but aspects of their size and shape can tell us something about what an individual was doing. For example, the shape of a tooth can tell us whether an animal was eating a lot of leafy material or perhaps eating um, insect, or insect material or even more fruit. So we can say something about the diet of an extinct species. My research, however, focuses more on the growth and development of an individual. Teeth are important because they can tell us whether an individual died when it was still growing its dentition, all of its teeth, or whether it lived to be an adult. On an even finer scale, however, if we look inside teeth, we study the microscopic anatomy, we can get a much more precise record of how old an individual was, as well as things that happened while it was growing and developing. In my lab, we work to produce thin sections of teeth. This is one-tenth of a millimeter of a monkey tooth that was produced by taking the tooth out of the individual after it had died, putting it into plastic, and cutting a very thin slice. When we cut these very thin slices, we can use microscopes to study the tiny microanatomy inside the tooth crown. This includes a record of an individual's growth even before it was born. We know that the birth line, which is captured in teeth, is the perfect birth certificate to be able to give an age to an individual who died while it was still growing its teeth. So by making these thin sections of teeth and using polarized light microscopy, we can see this very precise record of growth and development. So what you're seeing here is a live microscope image of a thin section of a monkey tooth that shows a number of stresses that occurred while this individual was still growing and developing. Because there is this faithful record of birth, as well as every day of life after you're born preserved, we can assign ages to these stress lines and actually then look at the histories of the animals and figure out what was happening that was so stressful in these individuals' histories. 
This particular monkey we're looking at here had some stress in her third and fourth year of life that actually led to her uh, losing the infant that she had been carrying. She was pregnant and she lost the infant. And so we're interested in taking this information from animals of known histories and trying to better infer what kind of stress we're seeing in the past. Here you're seeing what I would call a time map of an individual who was a captive monkey that was raised in captivity and died for natural causes. And in this case, I was able to pick up every day of its life after it was born. Using very high powered microscopes, I was able to see when this individual was born and then to find stress events that occurred as it was growing and developing. Teeth formed by the addition of layers, one layer on top of another, every single day after another. And so if you understand the way that the teeth are basically adding these layers, you can give, again, these timelines ages. So this animal, I was able to find a series of developmental stresses that occurred during its first year of life and continue counting all of the growth lines until the very end. At the bottom here, in the lower right corner, is when the animal died. And I was able to give an es estimate of its age at death just based on the information inside the teeth. When we compare these estimates to information from animals' uh, medical histories, we can be very precise, sometimes within a day or a week of the actual age of death. This image is showing you a close-up or a high-powered micrograph of the last year of a monkey's life. And you can see a number of really marked, darker growth lines that corresponded to events in this individual's history. In this case, the animal became sick and had to be hospitalized and given antibiotics. It had a, an illness that caused it to lose weight, and that stress, that physiological stress, shows up as these accentuated growth lines in the individual's teeth. So teeth grow by adding layers, almost like tiles on a roof, layer upon layer upon layer. We can recognize the birth line, and therefore we can add each layer upon one another in time to be able to give ages to different parts of the tooth crown. Recently, we conducted a study where we looked at the chemistry of the tooth with microscopic resolution, and we were able to combine knowledge of the chemistry of what an individual was eating as its teeth were growing with knowledge of when each part of the tooth was being formed. So we were able to integrate this really careful incremental pattern of growth based on the biological rhythms that are occurring in our body on a daily basis with information about what animals were eating, when, for example, they were breastfeeding, when they began to start to supplement mother's milk with solid food, and when they finally stopped breastfeeding. And that's because as we're growing and developing, the record of our, our blood chemistry is being recorded inside our teeth as they are mineralizing. So we have this very faithful record, not just of time, but also of our, our diet. The issue of human weaning is something that really intrigues human evolutionary biologists. We know, for example, that our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees, tend to nurse their juveniles until they're about five years of age. Whereas in humans, even in traditional hunter-gatherer societies, mm -hmm. mothers tend to cease breastfeeding their infants by about two to three years of age. And one belief about this is that it's advantageous to stop breastfeeding as soon as possible so that one can have another infant. Uh, obviously, we can only put our energy into one infant at a time, and so this idea of having a shorter period of nursing allows us to have more offspring over a given period of time than something like a chimpanzee or an orangutan, which may nurse to, from five to seven years of age. We were able to take individual teeth from children whose breastfeeding histories were known and actually examine the timing of the chemical changes within the teeth and compare this to knowledge of when the teeth were growing. What we were able to show was that when an individual is breastfed for a certain period of time, that shows up. The chemistry of the barium is highly enriched or the proportion is very high during the period where an individual is receiving mother's milk. When an individual receives a formula, like commercially available formula, the pattern becomes even more marked. We see an even higher signal of barium. And then when an individual ceases receiving any formula or milk, the barium levels drop off. They become very low. We were able to see these changes in the barium calcium signal in human infants, as well as in macaque infants. In the macaques, we were able to compare this to direct measurements of their mother's milk. 
And then finally, we were able to find this pattern of weaning in a Neanderthal fossil. In that case, we knew how long the tooth took to form, and we were able to measure the chemistry, the signal of barium and calcium, from even before the individual was born until it was 2.4 years of age. And what was remarkable in this study was we found a relatively short period of maternal milk input. By 1.2 years of age, this individual had stopped receiving breast milk. The barium levels were very low at that point, which is similar to human infants and to monkeys when they stop receiving mother's milk. In this case, we didn't believe that this was necessarily a natural process because there was also a stress associated with this change. We think something may have happened to the mother, to this individual, that led to an abrupt cessation of breastfeeding and uh, something that caused a trauma that was marked in the teeth. Now that individual survived that event, but only made it to eight years of age. Using the careful record of growth and development that these lines represent, I was able to assign a precise age to this individual, and again, we determined it was eight years of age. Some of the earlier work I have been involved in has been a comparison of growth and development in Neanderthals and early modern Homo sapiens. We've been able to use very high-powered imaging methods at the synchrotron in Grenoble, France, to study these biological rhythms in teeth without cutting or breaking the fossils. So we've been able to get at how teeth grew in a number of juvenile Neanderthals, as well as several Homo sapiens individuals, to see whether there's a difference in the period of growth and development between these two close relatives. As it turns out, the early Homo sapiens fossils that we've studied show a pattern of growth and development that's very similar to living humans today. It takes them a long time to finish growing their teeth and become adult. In contrast, the Neanderthals seem to show a more rapid pattern of growth and development. By the time a Neanderthal erupts its second molar, for example, a modern human would still be erupting its first molar. So we see a real difference in the pattern of growth and development between Neanderthals and modern humans that we can get at because we have these very precise methods of assessing uh, the time of tooth formation. The work that we do in the lab here at Harvard is based on classical histology, which means we use microscopes to look at cross-sections of teeth with very high resolution. However, I simply cannot cut all of these fossils that I'm interested in studying to be able to understand their growth and development. This is why I'm lucky to collaborate with Paul Taffereau at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility in Grenoble, France, where we use high-powered x-rays to virtually go inside teeth and be able to see these same biological rhythms without cutting or breaking the fossils. At the synchrotron, we've been able to scan dozens of juvenile fossil hominins from as old as four, four and a half million years of age to even as recent as 30,000 years of age to be able to better understand how their teeth were growing, which gives us some insight into their overall pattern of growth and development. The traditional way of giving an age to a fossil that we might find in the fossil record is to look at which teeth have come out into the jawbone. So for example, if there's the first molar erupted, we know modern humans would erupt that tooth at about six years of age. So classically, you might call that fossil a six-year-old because it has that tooth erupted. However, when we use this information of rhythms inside the teeth, we can get much more faithful uh, or accurate estimates of uh, the age of an individual when it died. And it turns out that many early humans grew and developed more rapidly than living people. So if we only assume that, we, that early humans follow modern human growth patterns, we have a circularity problem and we're not actually getting at the real ages of these individuals. So this new technique of using these growth lines and teeth gives us a much more accurate way and it's actually showing us something we didn't understand about the past, which was that these early fossil humans did not grow and develop like we do today. I think for me the most rewarding part of this type of research is really the intimacy of the information that I'm gathering. There's something really powerful about being able to look into somebody's past on a daily basis and try to better understand what their life was like, um, how often they were sick, how long it took for them to grow up, um, perhaps speculate on why they didn't survive to adulthood. Um, there's something really very, for me, kind of beautiful about this type of information. It's something we can quantify, we can count days of growth and development, but we can also use this to really create a history of somebody's life in a way that we can't with any other biological tissue.
there are certainly challenges to doing science and studying human history and human evolution. Um, one of the challenges is the political aspect sometimes to getting access to fossil material. Because fossils are rare and discoveries are uncommon, the fossils are held in museums that are often controlled by people who've discovered them or people who curate them, and it takes uh, some effort to be able to convince curators that it's important to fly a fossil from Africa to France for imaging or sometimes even to cut a tooth to create a thin section to study how that individual grew and developed. So I wasn't aware when I started this journey that I would have to also be a savvy negotiator and politician as well as a skilled scientist and that's been at times challenging. There are definitely challenges. This is something as a woman in paleoanthropology I found can be difficult you know, the idea of having to do battle to um, get access to something or, you know, deal with sometimes aggressive behavior on the part of people who discover material and want to protect it. And so I know that this is something that, again, I didn't anticipate as I went into grad school that I would have to come up against, um, you know, a culture where there is still, you know, a little bit of a patriarchy. And, you know, I've had to work on ways of negotiating my career in a field that's really challenging and sometimes quite competitive.